When I buy a mattress online, I pay for it with my credit card. Behind the scenes, a complex series of transactions occurs between a payment gateway, the credit card company, and a few banks. There are problems with this process. It's slow, it's complex, it involves the synchronization of several different parties. Also, I can just buy my mattress. Some consumers will not want to purchase that mattress because they do not have the cash up front, and the lending rates that they get offered are higher than they're willing to spend. If these consumers were presented with more intelligent loan rates, the lender could still make money, the mattress company could still make money, and the consumer would get a new mattress. It's a missed opportunity all around. A firm is a consumer financial services company. Their first product offers loans to consumers making purchases. In today's episode, a firm CTO Libor Michalik explains how a firm decided to build this product and what they've done to scale it. The conversation took me by surprise because a firm was started by Max Levchin, who was a co-founder of PayPal, and I assumed that when a firm was created, they already knew exactly what they were going to build because a firm is a payments company and Max has knowledge of the payments industry going back several decades. But in reality, a firm started out with more vague ideas around what they were building. They spent some time running small experiments and they just looked for product market fit, just like a bootstrap startup would have. It was inspiring to know that even as an experienced team, they were willing to go through the humble process of searching for a product within a space that they were deeply familiar with. We didn't get to all the questions I was planning to explore, but I hope to do another show about a firm in the future. We've done shows in the past about engineering at other payments companies like Stripe and TransferWise, as well as other financial technology like blockchains and automated trading. And if you're looking for all 700 of our episodes of Software Engineering Daily, you can check out our apps on the iOS or Android App Store. You can listen to those episodes at softwaredaily.com. We've also got tons of episodes on business and distributed systems and lots of other topics. And if you want to become a paid subscriber to Software Engineering Daily, you can hear our episodes without ads. You can subscribe at softwaredaily.com. And all of the code for our apps is open source. If you're looking for an open source community to be a part of, come check out github.com slash softwareengineeringdaily. With that, let's get to this episode. Apps today are built on a wide range of backends, from traditional databases like Postgres to MongoDB and Elasticsearch, to file systems like S3. When it comes to analytics, the diversity and scale of these formats makes delivering data science and BI workloads very challenging. Building data pipelines seems like a never-ending job, as each new analytical tool requires designing from scratch. There's a new open source project called Dremio that is designed to simplify analytics on all these sources. It's also designed to handle some of the hard work, like scaling performance of analytical jobs. Dremio is the team behind Apache Arrow, a new standard for end-memory columnar data analytics. Arrow has been adopted across dozens of projects, like Pandas, to improve the performance of analytical workloads on CPUs and GPUs. It's free and open source. It's designed for everyone from your laptop to clusters of over 1,000 nodes. Check out Dremio today at dremio.com slash sedaily. Dremio solved hard engineering problems to build their platform. And you can hear about how it works under the hood by checking out our interviews with Dremio CTO Jacques Nadeau, as well as the CEO Tomer Chiran. And at dremio.com slash sedaily, you can find all the necessary resources to get started with Dremio for free. I'm really excited about Dremio. The shows we did about it were really technical and really interesting. If you like those episodes or you like Dremio itself, be sure to tweet at Dremio HQ and let them know you heard about it from Software Engineering Daily. Thanks again to Dremio and check it out at dremio.com slash sedaily to learn more. Libor Michalik, you are the CTO at Affirm. Welcome to Software Engineering Daily. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. 
I want to start with a basic user problem, and then we're going to work our way towards engineering. So let's say a consumer wants to buy a mattress online or any larger purchase that takes a lot of money. The consumer does not have cash to pay for that mattress immediately. And if we're putting ourselves in the world of traditional consumer finance, the main option to pay for that mattress, if you don't have cash, is with a credit card. So you've got Visa and MasterCard and Amex and Discover. What are the downsides of using a credit card in that situation? The main downsides is that the ultimate all-in costs at that point are not presented in a clear manner and to a certain extent are difficult to know based on how else you're using that credit card. So once you start revolving on that credit card, all your other purchases that you're going to put on it are going to carry interest as well. And your pay down plan is not clear and the costs will be opaque to you. The logical thing to do if you were to put it on your credit card is at that point to stop using that credit card entirely. Now that is not a straightforward option for most people. So when they go into make a purchase and they know that it's going to be something that they have to pay for over more than one month period based on their cash flow, the logical thing would be to use something where they do know exactly how much of that one purchase is going to cost them over some period of time that fits their cash flow. So similar to how a lot of us wouldn't put a car on a credit card for a number of people, any large purchase that goes beyond what you can afford in one month would fit the same criteria as I want to know upfront how much this is going to cost me all in. And that's where we come in. In that world where customers are interacting only with the traditional credit card systems, what are the other big inefficiencies? The other big inefficiencies that we like to think about are the pricing on the per purchase basis is one of the big ones. By that, I mean the merchant has various ways to, you know, has the merchant merchant specific underwriting allows us to price that transaction specifically to not just where's this user coming to us from the merchant, but what is the merchant willing to help uh, subsidize in those purchases. And so, for example, large margin products like mattresses, we can work with the merchant to ensure that the user gets the best deal possible. For example, things like 0% interest on those purchases for those products. Similarly, users that wouldn't be able to get credit or otherwise, we can work with the merchant to ensure that they can get credit at reasonable prices. And similarly, improved interest rates or even things like temporary or you know partial zero percent or cashback rewards various uh, ways where by looking at that exact transaction we can make sure that the user is getting the best deal this is different than where the user normally would in traditional credit cards you know you would move from your bronze card to your silver card to your gold card to your platinum card at you know sort of one decade at a time as your finances and credit improved over time this is something that we can do uh, you know on the spot for every single transaction and make sure that that point in time based on the most up to date credit information and merchant information that we have we can price that deal optimally for both the user and for the merchant so in the example with the mattress mm-hmm. you alluded to the fact that a mattress is a high margin item. Each individual mattress purchase is going to lead to a lot of profit on the part of the mattress creator. And if there's a situation where a customer cannot purchase that mattress because they don't have the cash handy and a firm can facilitate the transaction by providing a alternative financial purchasing process, then you can potentially take out margin from the merchant while keeping the deal that the customer has the same. So opaque, that process is opaque. So the customer just gets the perception that, oh, they pay zero interest. That's remarkable. Whereas the merchant is saying, well, that customer would not have been able to purchase the mattress otherwise. That's remarkable. Even if we make 75% margin instead of a 80% margin, then we're still, you know, we're still gaining 
capital that we would not otherwise gain from that transaction, and then a firm gets to pick up the difference. Is is that accurate? I, I wouldn't say high margin. I, I would more specifically say that the I mean the mattress is, uh, is actually very competitive, and so it's hard to say that it's high margin. But it obviously the merchant um, has some amount of budget for things like marketing for for their own take home as well, and they want to be able to ensure that the user is getting the best deal possible for things. In, in a mechanism that actually matters to the user that users respond to. And so the most obvious is these are larger purchases and the typical customer isn't able to pay for it on a, you know, in a lump sum manner. And so that small difference of, you know, taking it from, you know, 10%, 15%, 20% interest for, for, you know, for a year, you know, something that would take somebody a year to pay back or six months, uh, being able to move that to 0% is um, something that users see as a clear benefit um, to their pocketbook and sort of bang for buck from the merchant's perspective. It's much more effective than, you know, plastering a BART or, you know, the subway with ads, um, giving it, giving that directly to the user who's already interested in that mattress makes much more sense for them. And that's where we like to facilitate that transaction by making sure that our users are getting the best deal possible. This is, of course, not mattress sales daily or financial engineering daily. It's software engineering daily, and we will get into the software aspect of things. But I wanted to start with this microcosmic example just because looking into some companies like Affirm and like Stripe and these other newer fintech companies, Wealthfront, you see how many opportunities there are for fintech players with some sophistication in technology to come in and improve the world of consumer finance. So we've given this microcosmic example of the mattress purchasing process, but there's a much wider array of problems that the average consumer encounters when interacting with the financial system. What are some of those other big problems? Give me a a larger idea of the scope of what challenges a firm is trying to tackle. Well, I, I think the the probably the sort of at the highest level when we think about what is the opportunity for a company like a firm within consumer finance, we look at you know where does a lot of the profit in consumer finance come from, and it, a lot of it comes from the unwanted or the undesirable or the unexpected happening to the customer, and this level of asymmetry between users that are attempting to manage their finances, accomplish their financial goals, and where a lot of the money that's made from those customers is coming from, seems that asymmetry seems ripe for disruption and, and for a better product, a better consumer experience to come in. And so that... And that that can be in the form of credit, in the form of payments, in the form of savings, investing, all of the above. And we decided to start with credit because that has a clear, clear, compelling use case, even when as a company we were small and, and just getting started. The clarity there for us was, okay, you know, if you were thinking about this from sort of first principles, what would that look like? And, obvious, and it seemed obvious to us that you would put forward the upfront costs that the user was going to pay. You know, we all know that if you're going to pay for something over a longer period of time, it's going to cost you more. Having that level of clarity, um, knowing that there's no late fees, that there's no going over this amount. And in fact, if you if you pay off sooner, you come in under that amount, but that there's a cap and that the user can say, is this you know thousand dollar sofa worth an extra seventy dollars to me to have it uh, a year earlier? That seemed like a cl- clear value proposition to the user. The users obviously started using that product, and um, and the merchants liked it for for similar reasons. There's uh, there's plenty of asymmetry and in information that exists, and I think that's where a lot of the opportunities uh, are, where we can, as on credit, as on savings, as on credit debt pay down, um, you know, getting out of debt, all of these elements are 
there's a lot of information that the use about the user out there that the use, user has about their credit, about their finances, and using technology, using software to help them better understand um, exactly where that they are in that ecosystem, and and what is you know what is twelve months outlook for them? How do they improve their financial situation? It's an interesting dynamic where I think there's a lot of room to have information parity with the, with your customers, um, where, you know, the company's understanding of that customer is improved by that customer understanding how that information is being used and how that information um, actually informs those decisions. And so some of the, the ways we think about the problem going forward is how can we improve that um, sort of bi-directional information feedback loop between us and the customer to, you know, further refine and further improve both what the customer sees and what we understand about their ability to, you know, manage their finances, their ability to take on credit or, you know, savings, um, their goal, you know, helping them achieve those goals. The first product that you focused on was this credit application. Explain what the first version of the Affirm product did and what the product surface area was. There is many, many iterations of the first product before we found something that was both compelling to the customer and the merchant. Obviously, you need to be able to distribute your product for it to gain any traction. And the you know the first n iterations of the products were entirely about solving for that. the The first iteration, the first first iteration was a stripped down deferred product, deferred interest, or not deferred interest, deferred payment product. It was almost a simplified invoicing product and less cre- and a less of a credit product where the user would go through a purchase flow and they were, there was a much simplified purchase flow compared to you know entering your credit card information, especially on a mobile device, and where we would just get their phone number and, and a little bit of information. And then um, you know when they were back at a computer, a couple of weeks later, a month later, be able to send them an in- invoice for payment. And so initially, the idea was, okay, how do we simplify that process? And then as we you know, went through version after version to see what was actually resonating with people, it became clear and clearer that people were beginning to use it as a as a credit product and, and wanting to pay back in multiple installments. And that really quickly then sort of said, oh, I see. The, the thing that they're responding to is not just the convenience of how to make purchases like this on a mobile device, but actually pointing towards that, you know, the users themselves pointing us towards, well, credit for us is broken. You guys are, seem to be going down this path. Um, help us solve this problem. That's a fascinating way of exploring the domain of consumer finance. So you had some set of merchants that you were working with that as part of the checkout process, the user was presented with the option of paying with a firm. And if you pay with a firm in, in the uh, product market fit search period of time, the, for, for for the, from the firm's point of view, you just enter like your phone number and you get your mattress paid for or whatever the product was. And then it's like the mattress comes and you're like, that was magical. And then a firm behind the scenes is like, okay, what are we, (laughs) how are we going to turn that into a product? Exactly, exactly. And that was a lot of it is like exploring the space of convenience and, you know, what doesn't work in that space today. And that, that sort of search started really pointed the avenue towards both of the, the, you know, from the customer's point of view, the broken credit, but also from the merchant's point of view, where that convenience and that new type of com- credit that customers were responding to was a value add for both of them. And, and that, that was really where we were like, oh, okay, this makes sense. And from that point where we started to tune the product for, okay, well, what do we need from the user without making it a burdensome checkout process? What do we need to actually provide credit over longer periods of time? And obviously, from the merchant perspective, how can we help quantify for them exactly who are these users? How are these users responding to this product? And therefore, um, you know, getting them excited about it as well. Software workflows are different at every company. Product development, design, and engineering teams each see things differently. These different teams need to collaborate with each other, 
but they also need to be able to be creative and productive on their own terms. Airtable allows software teams to design their own unique workflows. Airtable enables the creativity and engineering at companies like Tesla, Slack, Airbnb, and Medium. Airtable is hiring creative engineers who believe in the importance of open-ended platforms that empower human creativity. The mission of Airtable is to give everyone the power to create their own software workflows. From magazine editors building out their own content planning systems, to product managers building feature roadmaps, to managers managing livestock and inventory. Teams at companies like Condé Nast, Airbnb, and WeWork can build their own custom database applications with the ease of using a spreadsheet. If you haven't used Airtable before, try it out. If you have used it, you will understand why it is so popular. I'm sure you have a workflow that would be easier to manage if it were on Airtable. It's easy to get started with Airtable, but as you get more experience with it, you will see how flexible and powerful it is. Check out jobs at Airtable by going to airtable.com slash se daily. Airtable is a uniquely challenging product to build, and they are looking for creative front-end and back-end engineers to design systems on first principles, like a real-time sync layer, collaborative undo model, formulas engine, visual revision history, and more. On the outside, you'll build user interfaces that are elegant and highly customizable, that encourage exploration, and that earn the trust of users through intuitive, thoughtful interactions. Learn more about Airtable opportunities at airtable.com slash se daily. Thanks to Airtable for being a new sponsor of Software Engineering Daily and for building an innovative new product that enables all kinds of industries to be more creative. I just want to comment on the humility of that approach where you've got you know yourself and Max Levchin, the, the CEO, between you two have experience at PayPal, at Google, at Slide, the company you started before that. And instead of taking an opinionated approach to here is our perspective on the market and we're going to build this product, even with the volume of experience that you had, you took the humble approach of let's let's really try to approach this space with wide eyes. And I, I find that that's rare. It's in a, it's kind of inspirational to think about that. Well, I think I mean I think for both of us, or and for the team as well that we've put, put together, I mean, that that's been sort of a driving ethos over over the course of it. Was you know you have your theories, you have your prejudices of how things work in the world. But, uh, you know, you, you, I think you do it enough times, you realize that, you know, that's only a starting point. You actually have to understand uh, and you have to f- discover uh, the process of, you know, why do users respond? You know, why, you know, how, and by users, I mean the customers, the merchants, you know, providers of capital, you know, wh- how do they think about these problems? And like I say, you have starting points for ideas, you know, the unfairness, um, the asymmetry, all of these things of, of the existing consumer finance. But you also have to ultimately, you know, put those to a test and, and think about what does everybody else um, actually think about this. And so, you know, we, we one of the things we talk a lot about here as we build out the team is the idea of building a startup as a journey into the unknown. Um, and that itself requires a level of humility. And so we look for people who that excites them. This, you know, we're gonna we're gonna go. We don't know the answers, but we have the skills and we have the confidence and capabil- in our capabilities to go figure this out um, and make it happen and see where the journey takes us. And, and people who are excited about that are the you know people we love to work with. So, by the way, is uh, one other question on this product market fit search space? W- who were the merchants that you were working with from the early days? Can you comment on that? Our first merchant, though, the first merchant that really took a chance on us was 1-800-Flowers. They were the one that we did a lot of exploration with and then went from there to, you know, work with Casper on the mattress side was one of the first ones. Uh, we worked with uh, Real Real and Tradesy really early on. These were the, and they're pretty dis, all pretty distinct merchants. And so that helped us also think about what does the product look like through different um, merchants. 
lenses. And, and that, that journey continues today, you know, as we start to work with companies like Expedia on travel or, you know, some of the large our offline retailers, they're helping us to continue to think about like, you know, what, what does this look like in different merchant landscapes um, for different use cases and what type of users that we haven't seen before, you know, show up at, in, at those merchants and what does that product look like for them? And that really helps us continue to prioritize the, you know, the roadmap, build out the roadmap and, and explore it. And also, I don't know if this factored, it factored into your merchant selection, but it seems like flower purchasing or mattress purchasing are domains where there is a little less fraud on the purchaser side. That's definitely true. I mean, we have we did find and continue to find that in our fraud analysis, as well as in our underwriting analysis, that the merchant selection matters a lot. We sort of had that theory that that, that, that would be true, that people respond differently if they're buying durable goods versus consu- different types of consumable goods, different types of uh, durable goods. And that did play out uh, that way, probably even more so than we really expected. And so in that way, we were pretty fortuitous with the, with the initial selection. But you know, when you're that small, you're gonna, you know, you're, it's more about the merchants taking a chance on you than, than being picky about overly picky about, uh, you know, who you're gonna help out. So again, it sounds like the early product surface area was basically a, a little sign up form where you like enter in your phone number and then behind the scenes you're just like paying probably using some legacy payment integration software w- when did you actually like have to do <laughs> engineering work well i mean that's actually that i mean that is one of the things that's exciting so this is the the fifth company the fifth startup i've worked on and you know that's that's the exciting part for for me as an engineer is you go you pivot from the product market fit you know your op, your your code base and, and your team are are really optimized around the idea of let's explore let's use the small team and let's explore really really quickly uh, lots and lots of ideas and you're really kind of building your software around that idea and then when you when you stumble upon it um, or and you're like this is it Let, you know let's figure out how to scale this um, obviously you know it means scaling the team scaling the business but it also means scaling the code base because you're really expanding on multiple axes, everything from new features, more robust features to handle all the edge cases, software to hand that can support actually all of these engineers showing up and working on the code base, scale obviously from just the perspective of more users. And that ultimately going from this, you know, this prototype to this large sustainable business is an engineering challenge and, and it's basically engineering on fast forward. And I always tell, um, you know, especially younger engineers, but really anybody will listen. Uh, you know, if, if you, if you, you know, if you want to sort of have the quintessential software engineering experience of how do you go from something optimized for quick pivots to robust, you know, large scale software, and you want to have that experience as fast as possible, you know, go to a company, you know, like us or anybody else, really, who's going through that transition. And the faster they're going through that transition, you know, the, the more of it you'll sort of get from the fire hose. Um, and, and that's, that's been fun for me. And it's been consistently fun every time I've done it. So obviously, there's a, there's a number of different dimensions to the product at this point, you've got a ton of data that's coming through the system. But you've also got the product itself, the user facing product that people are, are integrating with or that are people are interfacing with, you've got the back end infrastructure. So you've got the, the product that people are interfacing with, you've got the back end cloud infrastructure where the transaction certain transactions are occurring, and then all this data is accumulating over time and you've got to run machine learning jobs on that to build a good risk model to be able to decide who is worthy of certain credit products. But I think before you get to the the scale out of the cloud infrastructure or the detailed risk model in machine learning discussions, you did have to build out this user-facing product. You had to build out the basic skeleton of some back-end infrastructure. Can you take me through that that early product, once you found the, the bit of product market fit that you wanted, but you had to build out the basic, I don't know, you know, Ruby on Rails app or Django app or whatever it was. It's a Python Flask app. Flask, um, yeah. 
Yeah, and yeah, exactly. It's, you know, it's it's you know, it's you know, you've got Flask and very kind of M, uh, model view controller uh, sort of paradigm uh, uh, sitting on top of uh, OR Mapper using a SQL Alchemy for that. Really, basically running you know running the site of the the online interactions between us and the merchant and the customer. And you've got a few batch pipelines that are sort of doing you know your nightly messages and your billing and your auto pay and you know using celery for some deferred tasks and that's kind of really really kind of formed the nexus of kind of where we started and including the online decisioning models and yeah that's where it started and that's really kind of what we've been iterating on you know one of the sort of thing one of the takeaways from you know, past experience has been, well, you're growing this business quickly, you're not going to stop to rewrite all of your code, partially because you're moving quickly, but partially because one of the things that's really, really, you know, hard in a fast growing environment is context on why are things the way they are, what decision, you know, why did these decisions get made? And a lot of times, the only thing that really embodies that sort of tribal knowledge of why are things the way they are is the code itself. Um, and so when you think about rewriting large code bases, you, you know, you know, you're, you're pretty confident and you should be relatively confident that, that you'll get the primary use cases um, correct. But all of the edge cases, right, that, you know, that have been tweaked and, and optimized during this growth, those are the things um, that you're likely going to miss when you, if you try to rewrite wholesale. And those are the ones that, that you worry a lot about because, you know, especially in our, in our case where the first feedback we have on a mistake with a model, a credit model, is going to be 60 days out, right, when we really start to realize, hey, this decision – prediction versus what's happening is off. Those are the ones that you worry a lot about. And so you you spend a lot of time, at least we did initially, saying like, okay, the first thing we're really going to focus on before we, you know, as we're growing, is let's get monitoring and alerting in place. Both operational monitoring is the thing working the way we expect it online and, and, the, and the batch pipelines, but also business monitoring is like, are the results coming in the way, the way we think they are and, focus, and alerting on top of that. And then, then, you know, the next big steps are, okay, now think about, okay, how do we pull this code base apart into constituent pieces and then how do we think about iterating on each of those as we go? And really sort of, you know, these are overlapping steps and, and, and approaches, but sort of taking it from there versus, okay, well, we have this code base, you know, it got us to here. Uh, it's obviously, you know, got, you know, going to have a tough time supporting 100, 200, 300 engineers. Let's throw it out and start over again. It's more of a, how do, how do we kind of walk this forward you know, while still making progress on the product? Of course. So that, early product is sounds were you able to kind of dodge integrating with traditional banking infrastructure no no we definitely sit at the at the nexus of a lot of partnerships we have we have a lot of data providers the, those are probably the most obvious ones everything from the traditional credit bureaus to some um especially on the fraud side non-traditional sources i mean non-traditional sounds probably more fancy than it is but things like you know phone porting records when was the last time this phone number was ported things like that and then on the Sorry, bank phone, side phone porting yeah you know when the last time this phone number changed hands how long ago oh, was that things, okay and on the bank side yes definitely a lot of a lot of traditional partnerships from everything from how we send money to merchants how we get money from capital providers and from our own bank accounts how do we get money back from the, from the users and you know how does this all flow through the different places it needs to, it needs to go um, a lot of that is pr- very traditional fun- funding of uh, funding operations um, and interacting with them and yeah that that's been definitely a learning experience as well mm. so what's the release process for a piece of consumer financial software? Do you have to go through audits? Do you have to go through, is there certain standardized testing processes you have to go through? I mean, yes, but nothing surpri- nothing that would look uh, surprising to somebody who's been writing software right in Silicon Valley over the last 10 or 15 years. Um, you know, one of the things we, we thought uh, and spent and continue to spend time uh, upon is when we think about, you know, what are the compliance regimes and what are the regulations about data access and testing and, and, and you know, 
disclosure compliance, all these things. We think about, well, how, do, how does that actually map onto good software engineering practices? Everything from code review to you know, automated testing to unit testing, functional testing, end-to-end testing. And it's really been a process of, all right, how, obviously this, you know, this um, compliance regime or this, this rule or, or what, what it's, it's trying to achieve something practical. What is it actually trying to achieve? And how do how would you actually translate that into something that logically makes sense to an engineer? And and then working with you know with our compliance team to make sure that the two actually map together and that we're that we're reading it correctly. But that's really been how we've thought about it. And so really, really early things like code review, right? So that every piece of software gets looked at by multiple people before it goes into production, that the release is signed off uh, and what is actually going into production is signed off by somebody different than the person who wrote the software, that we have good visibility into, you know, could anyone have touched it before that happened? Or do we have confidence that this really was looked at by multiple people before it went out? You know, who has access to the production environment? And again, you know, when you're moving fast, you there's times when you need access to right, production data, production code, uh, production environment. But being able to really to facilitate that with, okay, well, let, let's keep, a, you know, let's make sure we actually have visibility in what, into what's what that person's doing and somebody else can look at it, what that person did, you know, out of band. And it's been a process of translation. Translation. So we really early got to the idea of code review, automated release process, uh, release signing, uh, unit testing, uh, functional testing. So including videoing our some of our testing, so that legal could look things like that. You know, where at previous companies we wouldn't get to some of these practices until we were you know fifty, sixty, a hundred engineers. You know, these are things we were doing when we when there was just ten of us. So what are the important ways that the product has in advanced since the early days of a firm? The product, uh, the product, the, the, a lot of what has happened to the product is the, I mean, uh, sort of underneath the covers, there's a lot has happened with how we actually work with our capital providers in terms of how they understand the product and how they help, um, you know, fund the loans that we that we produce the the credit we push out the how we think about the models how we you know the data science underwriting and fraud platforms that we're building out really how we're thinking about you know first party and third party data for for those models and separating that out from right the rest of the code base that's moving fast and on the product side it's been how does the merchant and the customer better understand this product and how do we work in more and more environments and so you know, creating more visibility and more products for the merchant to work with so that they can tune the product and understand it, how it relates to their business better. And then on the customer side, it's been much more around clarity, customer support, and what that looks like, as well as once the user, you know, has has used the product for the first time, how they can use it in multiple situations. So we have, uh, you know, for example, we have a, you know, built out an app where we generate a one-time use credit card number for the user to use anywhere that they want to so that they can take this experience that they had at a merchant and basically, basically go to any other merchant and, and have a similar experience. Um, and to facilitate that, obviously, the rest of the world runs on credit cards. What we do is the user will tell us, you know, where what it is that they want to buy, where they want to buy it, and how much it costs, and we'll generate a one-time use credit card uh, for them to, to you know, virtual credit card to go make that purchase. Similarly, helping those users better understand their overall finances, and so, you know, having them link their other credit card accounts within the app to then paint a picture of, you know, how much are they paying in fees on their credit cards, um, how much are they paying in interest. And really help them understand where a firm fits into that picture, including, you know, when they should be buying on their debit card versus credit cards, uh, when when a firm makes sense, when it actually doesn't make sense to, you know, buy something at all. And probably the best uh, bet is for them to just pay down their credit cards and focus on that. Failure is unpredictable. You don't know when your system will break, but you know it will happen. Gremlin prepares for these outages. 
Gremlin provides resilience as a service using chaos engineering techniques pioneered at Netflix and Amazon. Prepare your team for disaster by proactively testing failure scenarios. Max out CPU, black hole or slow down network traffic to a dependency, terminate processes and hosts. Each of these shows how your system reacts, allowing you to harden things before a production incident. Check out Gremlin and get a free demo by going to gremlin.com slash se daily. That's gremlin.com slash se daily to get your free demo of how Gremlin can help you prepare with resilience as a service. The financial identity side of things seems important if you're starting to move beyond having specific merchants because because if you only have specific merchants that you're providing credit to consumers on within the domains of the uh, of those purchases your operations are probably a little bit simpler but if you start to get into the game of providing financial services around any kind of purchase then it becomes more well i guess it becomes only a question of who is this customer and are they credit worthy Right. Yes. And, and that definitely gets more more complicated. There is obviously some information about where, you know, when they use that instrument, where are they shopping? But that's one of the things that's actually beneficial to being, to having this incremental relationship that builds over time, right? Each, you know, each interaction with them provides more information about how they think about their finances and how they approach their finances and to what extent is it compatible with you know, what we're trying to do and, and what we're trying to provide and, and build on that over time. Um, but yeah, and what, what is interesting about that is from an engineering perspective is it, it starts to shift the, the weight of the decisions, each decision we make from third party data to first party data. And I think normally people think about, well, you know, first party data, meaning our data, that sounds easier because, right, it's your data. Um, and in some ways, it's actually, from an engineering perspective, it's actually a little, especially in a company that's moving quickly, it's a little bit harder than third-party data. The third-party data is fairly, in, at least in its interfaces and and how you interact with it is fairly static, right? These, these companies have been around for a long time. They're in the business of providing APIs into this data. And so it, it's fair. It's a fairly slow moving affair. Our, you know, our own underlying software and systems and data is moving quickly and evolving quickly as we build products and as we iterate on them. And, you know, thinking about what do those internal interfaces look like, like I said, as the engineering team doubles every 12 months, how do those interfaces look and how do we make sure that you know, where we have assumptions about how a piece of data is going to work that not only do those assumptions continue to hold over, you know, years, right, as these models um, sort of pick up steam, but that that is codified in the interfaces themselves and that we, you know, that we teams give de- dependencies to other teams versus teams taking dependencies on pieces of data, things like that. I, it, it becomes a fascinating for, at least I, I think, a uh, fascinating engineering challenge of how do you build something that grows quickly? Yeah. Okay. So the the third party data question versus first party data question I hadn't thought about that. So the first time a customer makes a purchase through a firm, if they're buying from one of these limited scope of merchants, like a mattress company, for example, and this is their first interaction with a firm and they give their email address, their, what is it? Email address, last four digits of their social and their phone number. Is that the, and their their name? And their name and their date of birth. Name and date of birth. So with that information, you can go out to third-party data providers that can say, here's credit report, here's the the most recent time the phone number changed hands, here is the average credit profile of of a millennial, for example, things like those. Those are well-established in terms of some of like the signal that you can get from those different things. You can also enrich it with all kinds of other data providers where you can get a really, really rich signal around somebody just from those essential four pieces of information. Yep. Five pieces. And yeah. five, five pieces of information. Right. And then over time, you develop a domain-specific understanding of 
how rapidly they pay for something. So then you can give them a more tailored credit opportunity cre- set of credit opportunities based off of your firsthand interactions with them and how they match up with perhaps some collaboratively filtered other set of customers that look like this type of person that have also bought mattresses. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. We start to build out a, you know, uh, how does that behave, you know, what does that behavior look like and what does it do about predictability relative to, you know, similar looking people and how they've behaved over time as well. Okay. So tell me what is hard about building the machine learning models uh, around this process. One, one thing you hinted at was the question of the time horizons for these. You know, you build some model around a limited time horizon because a firm hasn't been around for that long. I mean, it's been around since 2012. That's that's long in the time span of startups. It's not long in the time span of a person's financial lifespan. Exactly. And, and so in that sense, it's been also, uh, I mean, it's like it's a literally a learning experience, machine learning experience in that iterating on the models. So as we build out our own uh, first party data, it's it's retraining the models on more and more data. One of the things that, that is a challenge there is, right, the, the, you know, the code base. We, we look back, you know, call two, three years of, of users' information that we have, how they interact with our product. Well, obviously our code base is changed tremendously in that time. Uh, in the time that the team has gone from 10 engineers to 100 engineers, you can imagine the code base going through quite a bit of change. And it is, a, and we plan on a similar a sort of degree of change for the next three years. And so it is a challenge to think about, you know, how is the model interpreting this data from three years ago versus today? And how is it going to look three years from now? And, and the idea of sort of having this temporally agnostic data platform where you can go back in time, run a new model against what the data looked like at that point in time, see what the decision is like, and similarly go back in time uh, with a new, you know, with a new piece of data and think about like, well, what would have happened if we had, you know, used it at, the, at that point in time? And, and then obviously being able to train and validate those models and then put it. Oh, so back testing. Yeah, yeah, a lot of back testing and then validation. And the other part of it is also, you know, looking at, you know, obviously you don't want to just retrain on just data that the previous model told you was, you know, was a good customer. You obviously want to look at your false negatives as well, false positives, and be able to train against that data as well. And so the, part of this is, is, as we think about building these models, having them look at more data, having them produce um, sort of richer results as well across the space. And that means, you know, putting out models at a, at a fairly frequent cadence and being able to try, you know, being able to accelerate, not just keep the same pace as the data continues to grow, but actually accelerate at, um, the rate at which we can do this. And the penalty for getting a model wrong is that going to be that you have a higher default rate on credit? Exactly. Or it's a, okay. I mean, it can come in two, a few forms. It can come uh, through on fraud, that will let through people that we shouldn't have. the The fraud one is obviously uh, frequently is I think top of mind. But uh, one of the, I mean, what the good and the bad thing about fraud is that it moves pretty quickly. So it moves quickly, meaning you can lose a lot very quickly, but you can also detect it very quickly and, and, and you know, jump in and intervene. On the credit side, it's, you know, the opposite. And so a lot of things, if you get the model wrong, um, probably the worst is when you get it subtly wrong, right? where you're off by, a, you know, a few percent. And it, it's not obvious until a few months out of that, you know, you've been at... Um, you know, you've been lending at a, you know, at a su- slight loss, which, you know, at our scale can be millions of dollars. And because, right, you've, you've been doing it for potentially months that even if putting out a model now, it's, that still has to work its way through the system. And so those, those more subtle deltas are the ones that uh, we spend a lot of time thinking about and, and keeping an eye on. And though, you know, given a model where you have 40, 50 plus signals that go into it all with, various, you know, various weights being off on, you know, one or two of them can shift things pretty subtly. There's concern around bias in machine learning data sets and how that can affect opportunities for people who might fall into certain 
biased categories. Do you do anything to control for bias in the data sets? Well, we you know we stay away from signals that that would lend that kind of lend themselves to obvious bias. You know, we won't put like somebody's name or somebody's zip code into the model. Things that are kind of traditionally associated with, um, especially socioeconomic bias. Um, those, those policies, and we do also review the results. Um, so we and including independent review where you know we look at okay, well what what did we do and how does that you know how did that sort of come down on different groups and then we sort of benchmark that against how does the you know how does the rest of the industry perform to see exact to make sure that we're sort of going in the right direction with with these models so we do so we review so we look at it both internally uh, as well as sort of through external providers to see how we're doing we generally you know we feel like we've been actually doing quite well on this um, in the sense that looking at, you know, looking at a lot of signals about, you know, what are, how are people actually paying and repaying? How do they behave based on sort of where they've come from and what are they doing really does, I think, provide an avenue where we're not sort of just, you know, people who have not had access to traditional credit and sort of that becomes sort of a pernicious, persistent uh, problem for them, helping them to break out of that cycle. And so very, very quickly being able to establish a, a credit history with us and, and because it's on a per transaction basis, being able to really quickly from their perspective, as well as ours, be able to iterate on that, not going through this, well, you have this, you know, credit card where you have to, you know, put a down payment on the credit card itself, and you're going to be in that situation for two years. And then you get, you know, a slight bump in your limit. And that's another five years. Being able to iterate, not just from a, our model data perspective, but even from the user experience perspective, right, of this getting this feedback and, and being able to adjust to ensure that that we're as up to date on our decisions as possible, I, I think helps ensure that there is a better feedback mechanism for for the customer as well. That you know, positive uh, financially responsible behavior leads to uh, better results uh, in the product itself. Yeah, and I mean, not to mention you will get more opportunities for customers that way because oftentimes the legacy providers have not fact i mean legacy providers have their own models and they are probably more likely to factor in bias because they're more naive models and you have other companies i've had other companies on the show who are doing this kind of thing machine learning for short term high interest loans for example or or maybe even short term low low interest loans and they find that conventional financial service providers are, are often n- not serving certain certain people who biased data sets may may flag as not deserving of credit for invalid reasons and so that you know these you could build a very good business off of these types of you know yeah. different differential bias differentials and this, and this this does come into where we you know we set aside budget within our learning program to to actually you know look at users that are even the model says well we you shouldn't you know this this user can't be approved profitably letting some of the, looking at what how those users actually perform to ensure that we're expanding the scope of our underwriting and our and our fraud detection to really look at make it to a broader population um, and see how they perform versus right the model just telling you basically having confirmation bias, right? Where the model tells you, well, these, only these people are going to perform well. And if you only approve those people, then the next model you train is going to tell you basically the exact same thing, right? And so making sure that you are at, and that we are actively um, seeking out a broader population um, and including underserved populations to see, okay, you know, what else are we missing out there? Obviously, um, there's a whole... And whole universe of people out there, and making sure we're getting getting a you know as representative a sample as we can to make sure that we're not just you know learning this you know the conventional wisdom that we're going beyond that. So there's a ton of questions that I had for you that I don't I'm not sure if we're going to get to like some things around infrastructure, databases, build versus buy, 
you know, your choice of machine learning frameworks. I wanted to ask you some stuff about hiring, uh, and maybe we can get to that uh, if we if we do have time. But I don't I don't think we do. I wanted to to make sure that I got to a, a bit of a discussion about the future of finance. So you know, you've got this traditional banking industry and credit card industry that feels so legacy at this point. And and then you look at China, for example, and China leapfrogged to the US in terms of payments via phone or via watch or you know via fingerprint, who knows. I'm curious where you see the US consumer finance industry going. Is it going to look like what the Chinese payment system looks like today in a couple of years, or will it look like something different? What's your vision for the future? Well, I, I hope it actually doesn't look too much like the Chinese, <laughs> where, they're, where, they, where they seem to be going with things like, you know, a social credit score and using that to sort of power underwriting. That, that, that doesn't seem uh, particularly compelling where, you know, who your friends are is driving, you know, your access to credit. I, in some ways, I, I think it's almost a using technology to go back to basics towards simplification. I mean, at the end of the day, Right, people. Right, they they want to manage their money in a responsible way. They want to have access to credit for large purchases. They want it to be clear and understandable. You know, when they save money, they want to be building towards something. And it, it seems like you know, we have a lot of really large companies in you know, in the fin- consumer finance space that benefit extremely well from the overall com- increase in complexity and velocity of complexity that doesn't seem to need to be there, right? At the end of the day, the users want to understand the finances, their finances. Um, and so I think a lot of where we think about taking it is really using technology. You know, in, in some ways, I, I like to say being the first technology company in finance where technology is the actual differentiator of building scale efficiency for customers and, and customer acquisition and thinking about, okay, well, what, you know, how do you use technology to achieve those goals to provide clarity to the user across all of their finances, allow them to use, um, have access to those finances anywhere they are to facilitate what they're ultimately actually trying to accomplish, right? Finances is, is, is a means um, to what they're trying to do, not the, not the end goal itself. And so I, I kind of think about it almost from that, mostly from that perspective of how does technology at scale simplify the simplify this interaction? Are traditional retail banking industries are they adapting to all this new competition from the firms and the transfer wises and the stripes of the world? I think they will. Yeah. Yes. Yes and no. I mean, obviously, it's a very wide set of players in that market it's a you know obviously very large you you have the full range of responses um, you know I always, I always think of like the analogy is there's an analogy, analogy to sort of where amazon uh, was 15 years ago in there you know as they took on um, retail and how, how, what does that look like obviously when it's more convenient and, and and simplified. The there is this element of obviously there's people in, in banking that they don't sort of see the the issues with kind of where they're coming from and how they approach this problem. And those are the ones that you, you know that are going to be the you know the low hanging fruit from our perspective, so to speak. And there's obviously ones that are extremely sophisticated and and savvy and are going to you know are are not going to. They're not going to just continue to sort of double down on a, a changing world. They're going to they're going to adapt and, and pivot as well. So you have that full range, and and I think it right in, in the end you, you will see a different landscape twenty years out, and some of it will be uh, brand new players and and people who sort of are pushing the boundaries there, like us. And then you'll have some people who will still who are there today and who will be there in twenty years because they understood what these changes meant for them and and adapted. Libor, thanks for coming on Software Engineering Daily. It's been great talking. Awesome. Thank you very much. GoCD is a continuous delivery tool created by ThoughtWorks. It's open source and free to use, and GoCD has all the features you need for continuous delivery. Model your deployment pipelines without installing any plugins. Use the value stream map to visualize your end-to-end workflow. And if you use Kubernetes, GoCD is a natural fit to add continuous delivery to your project. 
With GoCD running on Kubernetes, you define your build workflow and let GoCD provision and scale your infrastructure on the fly. GoCD agents use Kubernetes to scale as needed. Check out gocd.org slash sedaily and learn about how you can get started. GoCD was built with the learnings of the ThoughtWorks engineering team, who have talked about building the product in previous episodes of Software Engineering Daily, and it's great to see the continued progress on GoCD with the new Kubernetes integrations. You can check it out for yourself at gocd.org slash sedaily, and thank you so much to ThoughtWorks for being a longtime sponsor of Software Engineering Daily. We're proud to have ThoughtWorks and GoCD as sponsors of the show. Wow. 